please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Good evening and thanks for joining us on What's Hot. I'm Shireen Bandha. Our top story this evening, Tata Consultancy Services has delivered in Q4 the IT giant reporting a dollar revenue growth of nearly 4%. This was also the highest quarterly revenue posted in the last 14 quarters. For FI18, TCS has seen its revenues grow by 11%. Kritika joins us now from the TCS headquarters. A strong quarterly print there from the company, Kritika. Good set of numbers uh, for TCS. Uh, for the fourth quarter, dollar revenue up by about 3.9%. And this is an incremental revenue growth of $185 million for the fourth quarter. This is the highest ever in a fourth quarter, which, remember, is usually seasonally weak. On all other parameters, as far as top line is concerned, constant currency growth of 2%, repeat revenue growth of 3.8%, better than expected. If you look at the financial performance, annual growth in dollar terms has been good at 8.6%. In constant currency, also 6.2% is in line. And last Largely, this has been led by the volume of digital deals that they have signed, volume of large deals that they have signed across the board. Margins up by about 20 basis points has been significant given that they had given a bonus issue. However, they're retaining the aspiration target range of 26 to 28 percent for the coming year is critical. Digital revenues have crossed $4 billion, up by about 35 percent on a year on year basis. It is now 23.8 percent of their business, and they aren't expecting this to grow further. This hasn't bottomed out yet. Uh, management has said that the soft areas, which is BFSI in North America, while they have been flat in this particular quarter, up by about 0.2 to 0.4 percent, they are expecting a, a recovery around the second quarter. So BFSI, for instance, has bottomed out and it should grow from here, which is very critical. They have given out a bonus issue of 1 is to 1 as well. The attrition is the lowest in the industry at 11 percent. But what is most important is the FY19 outlook. They have said that they are ending the year seeing a significant uptick in deal momentum. They hope that they will, it, this will continue. They are confident and optimistic that this will continue FI19. And what's very interesting is that they say that they are committed to eventually going back to double-digit growth range. Of course, no target over there as far as the timeline. But the outlook and the management commentary is definitely positive. I would say incrementally we are now more confident about BFS North America than hmm. we have been in the recent past. Though the revenues have still not started flowing in. But uh, early client discussions uh, show that there is not much of stress left in the system. And we hope that uh, that will translate into better spend through the course of this year. Okay. But uh, I think uh, Q2 will be a good quarter or Q1, the, hmm. Q, uh, the, our financial Q1 and their calendar Q2 will be a good quarter to validate that. Well, good numbers there from TCS. Watch out for the stock tomorrow. Away from earnings now to rapid developments in the courts and corridors of power over resolving bad loans. First up, the government and the Reserve Bank clearly divided over the central bank's new framework for bad loan resolution. Remember, just yesterday, the Reserve Bank's deputy governor, N.S. Vishwanathan, defended the new rules, saying that they will change India's borrowing culture. Today, the power minister has called the circular issued on the 12th of February as impractical and not workable. He's even called some post of the rule nonsensical. He went on to warn that large assets in the power sector will turn into sick assets. Before we bring you that exclusive interview, Sapna Das is standing by with how the government is responding to the Reserve Bank's new NPA rule. So Sapna, after the supervisory issue over private sector banks and public sector banks, which saw the Reserve Bank and North Block go head to head, it looks like the 12th February circular is again a point of difference. Well, the government clearly uh, is not uh, standing back on its demand for a relaxation of the new NPA rules of the Reserve Bank of India, particularly on the one-day default timeline. So it's not just about probably giving 30 days instead of one day to recognize a non-payment of uh, principal or interest as a default, but the fact that probably this should sustain for the next one year. So basically, it's a kind of a call for a relaxation within a relaxation, not just extending the one-day default timeline to 30 days, but also saying that, you know, this should probably remain in place for the next one year. Now, we do understand that uh, RBI has clearly indicated that, uh, you know, probably this may not be in the, uh, not be on the radar as of now, but the government's pitch is very clear. The second aspect that is being flagged up, and that is a key issue, is that projects worth above 2,000 crores, particularly in the power, infra, 
coal, road sector, they may be badly hit because here generally, you know, sometimes the payments are not on time, the receivables don't come. So it's not actually a default, so to say, as a bad loan, but it could be a technical issue. Now to say, to term that uh, as, uh, uh, to term a one-day non-payment as a default and saying that your 180-day resolution period starts immediately may be a bit too much on the extreme. Uh, you know, the government quarters indicate this may affect the nascent bank credit growth that has been observed during the last quarter of the financial. And last but not the least, this may actually push up stressed assets by another 1.24 lakh crores in the banking system. Now, the government clearly is waiting for further representations to come in. Uh, they would like to settle this matter in consensus with the RBI. So let's wait and watch this space for more. So the RBI circular is not workable. If, uh, you know, you follow that circular, a large number of additional assets will go into the uh, red i mean they will also become sick this is like driving some uh, driving up uh, you know somebody who just has who, who just started sneezing and you know driving him sick so this uh, circular needs to be changed so i am calling a meeting mm -hmm. uh, of the minister, uh, ministry of finance department of banking and uh, you know the rbi to discuss this uh, you know the if somebody's payment gets delayed, so mm -hmm. if somebody gets a uh, delayed payment from a discom, mm -hmm. therefore his his payment of installment gets delayed by a day. Mm -hmm. Under this circular, you know the, they'll have to start a resolution process, which is nonsensical. If somebody's you know the, uh, sort of uh, as asset goes into this uh, resolution process, then it is expected to be completed in 180 days. It's just impossible. I am not at all disappointed by that clarification because uh, what the point RBI DG made was that uh, the same discipline which you follow for the bonds and nobody defaults even for a single day, same discipline should be followed for the loans. So to expect that discipline, uh, we cannot find any fault with that arrangement. So uh, what the intent is that there should be a discipline in the markets and uh, expecting the payment on the due date. I don't see anything wrong in it mm -hmm. and uh, when the companies or the borrowers are planning their cash flow, so they have to plan their cash flow in such a manner that they meet all their commitments on the due date. If you are a bond, uh, supposing you issued bonds, right, you have to pay on day one, before day one, otherwise it's an issue of default. And see how rating agencies also, one day default with the rating, in the eyes of the rating agency, if there's a one-day default by a borrower to a lender, they downgrade, downgrade the uh, customer or the borrower to grade D, which is the lowest grade possible. So I think it should bring uh, discipline. There may be some logistic uh, issues, because every time you have this one-day or two-day delay, etc., some logistics will always come into play, therefore more work to be done. As far as the policy direction is concerned, as far as the intent is concerned, I think uh, uh, no one can find any fault with the basic emphasis uh, of the circular. But having said that, there are Sorry. two issues. One is uh, whether it, how you know it can be implemented with least friction, and second, mm. what kind of mm. outcome we are uh, expecting from this. Now, outcome, we all know that mm. what is uh, what the outcome being expected, that the stress in the banking system should be dealt with. But at the same time, the uh, as far as possible, productive capacity in the economy should be saved. So with yeah. that, the intention should be, as far as possible, regulation and not the liquidation. So from that viewpoint, I right. think there are three or four provisions uh, in, in this circular and mm. in subsequent discussion which has taken place, which, which to my mind, there mm. is a room for flexibility. Former Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank saying that there is room for flexibility without compromising on the spirit of the 12th February circular. The government not backing down, neither is the Reserve Bank. Now to the big corporate story of the day. There's been an unexpected twist in the SR Steel case. The company law tribunal today ruled that the second round of bids submitted for the Steelmaker 
is invalid. The tribunal has asked the creditors committee and the resolution professional to review their decision of rejecting bids by ArcelorMittal and New Metal in the first round of bidding. Ritu Singh joins us now with more details. Uh, Ritu, take us to the key observations made by the tribunal and where this leaves things. A very unexpected twist indeed. Uh, you know, the NCLT has reprimanded the resolution professional for not following due course in his decision to reject the bids that were submitted by ArcelorMittal and New Metal. In fact, the NCLT has said that because due process was not followed in the first round, the second round of bids that have been submitted by Arcelor with Nippon Steel, uh, JSW and New Metal as well as Vedanta are invalid now. In fact, the NCLT has referred the first bids from ArcelorMittal and New Metal now back uh, to the committee of creditors and the resolution professional asking them to revise, uh, you know, to revisit these bids and see whether or not they're meeting the uh, conditions and to give both of them cure period to see if they can uh, rectify the reason for which they were disqualified in the first place. So it is a big setback, uh, you know, for Vedanta. But of course, uh, Arsena and New Metal will have another go uh, at uh, SR Steel. And it's a very competitive bid, uh, but it is setting sort of a bad precedent also for some of the other cases. Now, the resolution professional was also reprimanded for not presenting this case to the COC and deciding that uh, they were uh, ineligible. Of course, uh, you know, uh, there is also the question of the 270-day timeline elapsing uh, on the 28th of April, but uh, thankfully the NCLT has said that the, you know, the amount of time spent in litigation will be added to that 270-day period, so there's no fear of liquidation. But of course, you know, there's the question of time value of money. Uh, both Harsala Mittal and New Metal have, of course, uh, welcomed the move, uh, and they maintain that the bids are strong and will be eligible for SR Steel. All right, Ritu, appreciate you joining us with that. From SR Steel now to Fortis Healthcare. Under fire from FII's like Eastbridge, the Fortis board today stopped short of taking a call on the suitors for a deal. Instead, the company has announced the formation of an independent advisory committee headed by former PwC chairman Deepak Kapoor. The plan will evaluate the binding offers by the 26th of April. Meanwhile, Fortis received a fifth acquisition offer today. KKR backed Radiant has made a non-binding offer for the hospital's business for 10,000 crore rupees. This is the highest offer at 164 rupees per share of Fortis and could be compelling if Radiant offers a binding bid which needs due diligence. Fortis board director Brian Tempest told our colleague Nisha Podar that at the moment only two bids, one from TPG Manipal and the other from the Bunjals and Burmans are eligible for evaluation. Whatever is the binding bids that are um, available with us on the 25th of April when the, when the um, advisory committee actually sits down, those are the ones that we will actually uh, focus on and the, and, and the best one from there will be sent to us uh, the next day on the 26th to the board meeting of Fortis Healthcare and then it will go to the shareholders. We've now got some binding bids that have improved so it's not only the original binding bid but it's got an improved binding bid and these are the ones that are actually going to be considered on the 25th uh, by the advisory committee. Looking at both the need, the quantum of funds required by the company and the need for speed, we made three or four changes uh, in the offer. One is we increased the overall quantum from 1250 to 1500 crores. Mm -hmm. Second is the upfront, which was 500 crores of injection oh, earlier, is now up to 750. And we've also removed the need for diligence, although we had asked for a very short diligence, but we've taken that away as well, just to make it quicker and simpler to implement. Well, the top national story, the Supreme Court has dismissed all petitions seeking an independent probe in Judge Loya's death case. Remember, Judge Loya was hearing the Sarabuddin Sheikh fake encounter case when he died in 2014. Dismissing the plea, the three-judge bench said that the judge's death was natural and that there was no ground to suspect any foul play. The Apex Court has also slammed what it terms is the misuse of public interest litigations and observed that PILs are being used for personal agenda. Ashmit joins us now with more details. Ashmit, you know, uh, a pretty scathing uh, uh, indictment there uh, of this petition uh, coming in from the court uh, suggesting that it was politically motivated. Indeed, uh, scathing use of words as far as the Apex Court in, uh, is concerned. In fact, uh, the general commentary as far as our, this judgment is concerned is that the Apex Court could have stopped short at just dismissing the application and pointing out that there is no need for a probe, but that's not what the Apex Court did. It went a step further and it went on to say that there is not an iota of doubt that the death was indeed natural in nature, that this petition was designed to malign uh, the institution. In fact, the words used were a frontal assault. These petitions were a 
frontal assault on the institution, also taking objection to the fact that there were direct insinuations made, uh, not just against uh, uh, judges of the high court or the lower courts, but also judges of the apex court itself. Uh, so clearly the apex court taking a very, very strong view to this, saying that such petitions are in fact uh, liable to face a criminal contempt action uh, by the court itself. Of course, the court hasn't taken that route as of yet. And even as you pointed out, uh, the court went even a step further and uh, took a shot as far as motivated PILs are concerned, uh, saying that this is a route that is made available to the citizens uh, to raise bona fide concerns. But indeed, what, what the court, what the, the judge has observed, what uh, Justice Chandrachur has observed as a part of this judgment is that increasingly they are being used to settle political scores, to settle scores with uh, business rivals, that this is a travesty of justice and is beginning to shake the uh, faith of the people in the rule of law. So really, really strong language being used. Uh, but the b b broad takeaway being that no probe uh, being initiated as far as the judge lawyer case is concerned. Back to you. Well, legal reactions coming in there. So it's the end of the legal process now, but we will probably continue to see this issue being dealt with politically. politically. With less than 20 days left for the deadline to submit bids for Air India, the government says the queries that has come in, how uh, the response there has been great. While speaking at the India Investment Conference organized by ASOCHAM, Deepam Secretary Neeraj Kumar Gupta said that any company that has the requisite funds and net worth can bid for Air India. And the queries that they've received so far are from airlines, non-airline companies, domestic companies, and foreign companies. Take a look. Even in Air India, if you talk about, we are not looking for only an airline to take over Air India. We have given a small carve out for airline, how the uh, domestic airlines will be treated in terms of eligibility in a consortium. But otherwise, anybody who has net worth and funds can bid for Air India. So remember, queries were meant to come in by the 16th of April. Queries have come in. These will be made public, hopefully, by the end of the month. Staying with aviation, Jayant Sinha, the Minister of State for Civil Aviation, today asserted that airlines would not be held guilty if flights are delayed owing to congestion at airports, which is the case today. Remember, the DGCA has come out with a charter under which it proposes a compensation of up to 20,000 rupees for passengers who miss connecting flights due to airline cancellations or delays. Airlines have opposed the DGCA's proposal to and nail. Today, Sena clarified that a penalty would be imposed only if flights were delayed owing to the fault at the airline's end. Take a look. In the draft passenger charter, uh, we have established certain penalties uh, for delays. But, and let me make it very, very clear, those delays are the ones in which the airline is held responsible. Anything that is force majeure, which includes weather, which includes runway delays, air traffic congestion and so on, uh, which is applied across the board so that it's not for a specific airline or a specific route, but the one that affects everybody across the board, those obviously are not uh, the airline's responsibility. If it is the airline's fault mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the passengers have to suffer, then we obviously have to find a way to compensate passengers for that. Jan Sena there on the proposal of the DGCA to fine airlines for delays and cancellations. On that, it's time for us to wrap up this edition of What's Hot, but don't go anywhere. Up next, what are the key risks to global growth in 2018? More importantly, what are the big risks staring the Indian economy? Prashant Nair discusses that and more with a special panel of experts at the Hero Mind Mind Summit 2018. We'll see you in 30 minutes on India Business Hour. For now, thanks for watching.